There we go. Okay. All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, real quick, uh, so the attendance grades are up to date. I'm still working on exam two, but um, I don't really have a lot left to grade. I only have one problem left, um, and so I, I genuinely think that the class is going to do fine. I don't really think you have much to worry about um, for, uh, for that. Now, a couple other uh, housekeeping items. So the attendance grades are up to date as of today. Homework seven, that was your mass TAN assignment. That's due today. Um, it looks like the majority, the vast majority of the class was able to get the software installed. We still have a couple people that had some issues uh, with software installation, but uh, I'll handle that one at a time. Keep in mind I have two computers in the transportation lab with mass TAN installed, but when we get closer to exam time, we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do on the exam. What I'm not going to do is hold anybody uh, in the class uh, to account because of like a laptop issue or whatnot. We'll figure it out. Don't worry about that. Um, homework 8.1 which is your first homework assignment on influence lines will be assigned today. Um, before I get into the lecture, um, I don't know if anybody saw the email from the dean this morning. Um, I want to echo that. Uh, just please uh, do me a favor, uh, if not yourself, and just be very careful when crossing 3rd Avenue. Um, I would uh, prefer that everybody cross 3rd Avenue on the crosswalk and don't just run, you know. Um, you know, it's not worth it. So uh, if you're a minute late to class, it's okay. You know what I mean? Uh, compared to the alternative. So, um, all right, let's get into the wonderful world of influence lines. I'm going to take your understanding of structural analysis and turn it upside down and inside out and tie it into a pretzel today. Um, because what we're going to do is um, arguably what uh, some consider to be the trickiest topic in this class, which is the theory of influence lines. Um, once you see it, it's easy. It can take a little bit of time to see it. I even brought a little prop, which you'll understand why I brought that today. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the motivation, what we can use influence lines for, and then just what the heck it is that they even are. Okay. So up until now, we have only dealt with problems where the load sits still. The load is stationary. I give you a structure. Here's the structure. Here's the loads on the structure. You analyze the structure. What if I just took that, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I analyze the structure. I determine the reactions, the internal forces. I could go even further and determine deflections. You, you name it, right? But if I were to take that structure and remove a load or put a load in a different position, it suddenly becomes an entirely different problem, right? Even if the geometry is the same, even if the, the um, uh, member properties are the same, if I change the loads, it becomes a different problem. You've got to solve for reactions again. You've got to draw shared moment diagrams again or solve method of joints, method of sections again. It becomes a different problem. Um, and so the question is, what if I move the load? Well, moving loads, in my opinion, raises two questions. Can we develop a tool to analyze structures subjected to moving loads and to be crystal clear, although I think everybody in this room is well aware of this, we do have to deal with structures that are subjected to moving loads, right? We deal with bridges. I'm a bridge engineer and by God you will learn something about bridges, okay? And this is part of it, okay? Um, the other thing is can this tool help us figure out the scenario for worst case load placement? Uh, and there's a third question in there, which we'll handle later, but I'll talk about that here in a second. So what do I mean by, can this tool help us figure out the worst case scenario for load placement? Um, let's say I'm designing this table, okay? And I've got this table, and let's say that this coffee cup here represents 100 pounds, right? Okay, so if, if I'm trying to design this table, let's say for moment, right? I'm probably going to get more bending, more bending moment in the middle of the beam, if I take the load and put it right here, right? Does that make sense? I, th I think that just conceptually makes sense. Now, if I was trying to generate, let's say, the worst case reaction, the worst case load on one of these two legs, where would I put the coffee cup? Put it over the leg, right? So hopefully this tool, uh, 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 coincides with our common sense understanding of how a structure should behave. But when we ever, whenever we have a structure that's a little tricky, 
that's a little complicated with multiple spans and hinges and fixed supports and you name it, hopefully this tool would be able to help us figure out the worst case load placement. Let, let, let's just you know uh, be straight with one another. We're engineers. We're in charge of design. Okay. Now let's just talk about design. How does design work? Well, you do the structural analysis to get the let's let's just take beams. Okay. You do the structural analysis to draw your shear diagram and your moment diagram, and let's say you get the maximum bending moment from the moment diagram, and then the, the result. Uh, from that is you take that maximum bending moment and you say, okay, now I need to pick a beam, or a concrete beam with reinforcement or a steel beam, et cetera, such that it has enough flexural capacity to withstand that moment, right? That's general purpose of design in a nutshell. But if the load moves, what I need to know is where to put the load to help figure out the worst case scenario. I want the maximum possible response out of that given load because that's what I'm going to design for. Does that make sense? Now, the third question, which we'll handle a little later, is can we actually use this tool directly to do the structural analysis? You know, instead of the tool just being some pretty little picture that tells us where to put the load and tells us what the response is due to a moving load, can we actually directly use it for structural analysis? The answer is yes. We'll do that part later. But we need to talk about this tool. Okay, this tool is called an influence line. All right. Now, a couple things. Number one, in this course, we primarily deal with statically determinate structures. Okay? Now, for a statically determinate structure, an influence line is just that, linear. Okay? Influence lines are lines for statically determinate structures. So if you are drawing an influence line for one of the homework problems in here and you're trying to curve it, you're doing something wrong, just point blank. Okay. The only time influence lines ever get curved is when the structure is indeterminate, and that will make sense hopefully after today. Okay. Even with my little handy dandy display here, that might that might be clear. Now, let's talk about an influence line. What is an influence line? An influence line is a diagram that we use to assess moving loads. It is not a shear diagram. It is not a moment diagram. I said this last time. I will say it again. It is not a shear diagram. It is not a moment diagram. Okay? It's going to look like them, but they're not the same. Okay? Here's how an influence line works. Okay? What you do is you take a structure and you got to pick a point of interest. Okay? Now, a point of interest could be, you know, if I have a beam, let's say we're talking about this table right here, the point of interest could be the reaction on this leg. It could be the internal shear right here. It could be the bending moment right there. It could be the deflection right here. But you pick a point of interest, a single point. And then what you do is you take a unit load. So let's say my coffee cup now is this unit load. And this coffee cup represents one kip. Okay? You could think of it as one kip, one kilonewton. It's really just one, right? Okay. Why do we use one? Because one's the multiplicative identity. If I know the response due to one kip, I can find the response due to 87 kips. How do I do that? I take the result from the influence line and multiply it by 87. Right? Makes sense. That's why we use one. And so what I do is I take that unit load and I move it across the structure. But as I move it across the structure, I keep my attention fixed on my point of interest. So if I'm focused on this reaction right here, I take the load, put it here, what's the reaction? The load here, what's the reaction? Load here, what's the reaction? Load here, what's the reaction? Etc. And then as I move the load across the structure, I record the response and I plot it. That plot is the influence line. Okay? We're going to I'm going to show you some shortcuts to drawing influence lines because by its very nature, that process is very iterative and very cumbersome. If I had you draw influence lines that way for every single homework assignment, it would be a lot of work. Okay? We're going to have some shortcuts to make influence line construction a lot easier. But as you're doing that, I want you to remember this definition because it's going to serve as a gut check for your results. Okay? Now, we're going to do a basic example. Okay? I have here a beam, simply supported beam. 
what we're going to do is we're going to take a single unit load and we are going to move it across the structure. Okay. Now for this problem, we are going to draw the influence line together for the reaction at A. So I need your help on something. I'm going to move this over here. Help me out. Let us say, for the purposes of the discussion, that I just put the load right in the middle. So this is my one kit. If I put the load right smack dab in the middle, what is the reaction at A? Say it again. One half. Exactly right. One half. So what I have here is a region for the influence line. And where I have placed that load, I'm going to say that this is one half. Does that make sense? How about this? Let's say that I have placed the load right here. What is the reaction at A if I put the load right there? One. What's the reaction at B? Hold on. What's the reaction at B? Come on. Zero. Everybody, it's not that early. That was a trick question. It's not a trick question. This is one. What if I put the load right here? What's the reaction at A? Zero. Remember, we keep our eye fixed on the reaction at A. So the reaction at A is zero if the load is at B. This diagram right here, that is the influence line for the reaction at A, right there. That's your first influence line. I'm going to stop for a second, see if this makes sense. So here you go. So let's just look at this plot for a little bit and let's soak it in. Let's see if it makes sense. What this plot tells us, this is the influence line for the reaction at A. What do I see when I look at this picture? I get higher values on the left, lower values on the right. Well, let's just think about that. This influence line represents the reaction at A. I don't know about you, but if I'm trying to maximize the reaction at A, I'd probably stick the loads, I don't know, closer to A, right? Make sense? Here's my table. If I'm trying to maximize load on this leg, I'm going to sit over here, right? Not over here. Sitting over here isn't going to have as much impact on this leg. Does that make sense? So AY is 1 when the load's at A, and it's 0 when the load's at B, and it's linear. It's a line. This is a problem dealing with influence lines. For statically determinate structures, influence lines are lines. I'm going to throw some really funky structures at you, and I want you to remember that. Now, to test your understanding, what would the influence line for the reaction at B look like? Boom, like that, right? This would be the influence line. Oh. This would be the influence line for the reaction at B. Does that make sense? So this would be zero. This would be one. You with me so far? Now, here's another pattern to this. What is that plus that? This value plus this value. What is this value plus this value? Now, see where these two intersect? Where do they intersect? Okay, so what's that value plus that value? You think that happens at every point along the influence line? Anybody tell me why? Who said that? What would you say? The sum of forces in the y direction must be zero. 
the vertical load is one down. So the reactions have to be one up. I don't care where the load is. This plus this, 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 this plus this. If you superimpose those together, you will get one. All the reaction influence lines have to sum up to be one. Does that concept make sense? All right, does anybody have any questions? All right, now, I keep saying this. I'm going to keep saying it. Influence lines for statically determinate structures are linear. There's a reason they're called influence lines. Now, for indeterminate structures, again, they'll be nonlinear, possibly, and I'll show you some examples of that near the end, but just keep that in mind. Now, how do we prove this? And, and, and related to this, can we develop an approach to drawing influence lines that's maybe a little bit more elegant, a little bit simpler, a little bit more straightforward? Okay. Now, what I'm getting at is what I could do is do this problem in Excel. right? I could say, here's a structure. Put the load here. What are the reactions? Put the load here. What are the reactions? Put the load here. What are the reactions? And just keep doing that and plot it, and I'll get you your answer. right? But that will take a long time. Is there a more elegant approach? Yes. The more elegant approach is what's called the Mueller-Breslau principle. This is weird. I'm going to tell you. All right? But it's much simpler, and it works. Now, I want to read the Mueller-Breslau principle word for word, and I want to show you how it works. The Mueller-Breslau principle states... The deflected shape of a structure represents to some scale the influence line for a force effect if that quantity in question is moved through a small unit displacement. I'm sure you're reading that and going, what? How, how many of you are probably like, well, I don't, what, what the heck are you talking about? Let me show you something. Now, let's take the steps here. Here's how the Mueller-Breslau principle works. So you identify a response of interest. What are you drawing the influence line for? Let's say it's a reaction. It could be a reaction. It could be a shear and moment uh, at a given point, axial force in a truss member, et cetera. Although for truss members, the Mueller-Breslau principle doesn't really work very well, not because the theory doesn't work, but in practice it's a little weird. So that'll make sense as we get closer to trusses. You remove from the structure the ability to resist this response. Remove the reaction. Later on we'll talk about hinge insertion, etc. Then you move the structure through a unit deformation at this point. The resulting deflected shape is the influence line. Watch this. Here's a beam. This beam is simply supported. Let's call this the reaction at A, this the reaction at B. I would like to draw the influence line for the reaction at A. I have identified the response of interest, the reaction at A. Now, if I'm holding this beam like this and this hand suddenly disappears, what's going to happen to the display? It's going to fall, right? It's going to, whoo, right? Okay. That's part of the reason why influence lines for statically determinate structures are linear. Because if you have a statically determinate structure and you remove a response, the structure becomes unstable. So it can't really flex or deform or go nonlinear because it's just going to collapse. So watch. Step one, identify the response. Reaction at A. Remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at A, and then move it through a unit displacement. Doesn't that look like the influence line for the reaction at A? I mean, what did we do? Let's go back. So here we go. Influence line. Remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at A. Pick it up one. That's the influence line. Does that make sense? Influence line for the reaction at B. Here's the beam. Remove the reaction at B. Take point B. Move it up one. Boom. 
influence line for the reaction at B. Does that make sense? That's what the Mueller-Breslau principle states. That if you remove from the structure the ability to resist the response in question and then move the structure through a unit deformation, you get the influence line. Okay? When drawing influence lines for reactions, uh, you need to rem uh, remember a few key rules. So let me take a step back. We're going to draw influence lines for quite a few different things. We're going to look at reactions. We're going to look at shears. We're going to look at moments. We're going to look at a bunch of stuff. We're going to start with reactions. And I've got my little display here to kind of show you what's going on. So I got here a beam. Now let's take a look at this beam. The beam has a support here, a support here, and a support here. And then it has an internal hinge. Kind of looks a lot like this, doesn't it? All right. And I'll show you how we get some of these influence lines. So a few key rules. We're going to start with reactions. Today's lecture is only going to be focused on reactions. So we're going to have a few key rules for reactions. Number one. Influence lines will always equal 1 at the reaction of interest, and they will equal 0 at all the other reactions. For example, let's take a look at this uh, uh, structure here. Okay, If I place the load at B, what is the reaction at B? What's the reaction at A and C? 0, right? So whenever you're drawing influence lines for, like, for example, the influence line for the reaction at A, it better be 1 at A, 0 here, and 0 here. 0, 1, 0. 0, 0, 1. Th does that make sense? So right off the bat, before you start even drawing any lines, you should have that figured out. They are always linear. They are always linear. So use slope ratios to determine paths. And finally, internal hinges serve to change the slope. So the idea is like, if I'm looking at this beam right here, this beam is really, I want you to think of it as two rigid links. So when I deform it, those two rigid links, the one from here to here and the one from here to here, are going to form two lines on each of these uh, influence lines. Now, let me show you something. Okay. Somebody pick one of these. I don't care which one. B? Okay, he picked B. All right. So here's my beam. Okay. We're going to remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at B. And we're... Uh-oh. I don't want to step on that. Then we are going to take this point and move it through a unit displacement. Do you see that? Everybody see that? So what I'm getting at, this dimension here is 1. But this dimension is higher than 1. Does that make sense? So like that's 1. That's bigger than 1, right? And we have two lines. Does that make sense? A line from here to here, a line from here to here. With me so far? Pick another one. C. Okay. So here's the structure. We are going to remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at C. Take the reaction at C out. And when I pick point C up, what's going to happen? Zero at the hinge. This is going to remain flat, and this is just going to come up, right? So the influence line for the reaction at C is just over, up. Does that make sense? So now we've done B, we've done C. Let's do A. Here's the structure. Remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at A. Now what's going to happen is because this is pinched, this is pinched. Hold on, I didn't, I didn't get that in there. Because that's pinch and that's pinch. When I lift this up, this is going to come up, but this is going to stay at zero, so it's going to sort of come down like that a little bit. You see what I'm talking about? See how, like, this has to stay at zero, this has to stay at zero, so we have positive, and then we dip down in the negative back over. So here's your influence lines, okay? So... Let's, let's see if we kind of can tie everything together.
Okay, let's look at item number one. One, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. See that? Okay, they're linear. Lines, lines, lines. And it says use slope ratios to determine the values along linear paths, right? So take a look at B, right? This is zero, this is one, this is zero. So how do we get this 1.5? Well, if this is one in 12, what is this in 18? Do you see that? It's a line, right? One is to 12, rise over run, as something is to 18. So this value here is 18 over 12, or 1.5. What about the reaction at A? 1, 12, rise over run, rise over run, something is to 6. 1 is to 12, as something is to 6, it's 0. 0.5. You want another check? Watch this. What is that plus that plus that? What's this plus this plus this? What's this plus this plus this? What's this plus this plus this? Happens everywhere, okay? That has to be the case. Any questions? All right, if you are good with that, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two problems. Now, I wanna show you something. I've, I've done a little bit different on the numbering. I have influence line example 1A and I have influence line example 2A. Today, all we're going to focus on are reactions. We're going to look at this structure. We're going to draw the influence line for the reactions. And then Monday, we're going to come back to this beam and draw the influence lines for shear and moment. Okay? So we're not doing the whole, um, the whole kit and caboodle today um, because we're going to use this problem for some later practice. So this one, we're going to draw the influence line for the reactions. This one, we're going to draw the influence line for the reaction. So for both of these problems, like this one, you can ignore the section cut, because we'll come back to that on Monday, because we're going to do shears and moments at that section cut. This one, you know, we'll ignore that point B, although we're going to use point B to sort of draw some value. So we'll, we'll, we'll end up using it, but it won't really matter. Okay. Okay. All right, so here's our problem. We're going to draw the influence line for the reaction at A, so we'll call this AY, and the influence line for CY. Now, I'm actually going to use the, the little fancy tools within T or within OneNote to actually draw straight lines because these are lines. All right, so let's start off with the reaction at A and the reaction at C on this beam. So help me out. What is this value going to be right here without drawing any lines? One. What's this value going to be? Zero. Now, how many line segments, how many rigid lengths are present in this beam? In other words, are there any internal hinges? So this influence line for the reaction at A should be a single line. Not like this problem where we had, you know, like a line from here to here and a line from here to here because of this hinge, right? It should only be one line. Does that make sense? So I propose that if I remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at A and take point A and lift it up one, I'm going to get an influence line that looks something about like this. So, boom. That's the influence line for the reaction at A. That's it. Now, let's see if you're paying attention. What 
is that value right there. It's a line. Huh? Not 0.25. It's one third, right? Because this is a rise of one over a run of 30. So this is one over 30. This has got to be a third over 10. Does that make sense? So this is one third. So if that's one third, what's this? Negative one third. Boom. Congratulations, you just drew your first influence line. What do you think? Is this that bad? All right. So somebody tell me then, what does the influence line for the reaction at C look like? What Mr. Adams said, just boo, right? It's exactly right. Uh, boom. This value is zero. What is that value right there? One. What is this value right here? Right there. There are two ways of ascertaining what that value is. The first is rise over run. A rise of one over a run of 30 means a rise of two thirds over a run of 20. That's one way. Another way of doing it is, what does this plus this have to be? One. One. So with that same logic, what's that? Four thirds. So what this influence line tells you is, okay, if I want to maximize the load on the support at A, like if I had a single copy cup of load, a single 50 kip load, whatever, where do I put the load to get the worst case vertical reaction at A? Well, it's kind of different. I could have a positive upward reaction if I put it over here, right? What do you think it means if I put the load here? What's the reaction look like at A? It's a downward reaction, right? So now, ooh, that's a little different. We don't have a worst case single scenario with A. We have like a range, right? A maximum worst case upward reaction or a maximum worst case downward reaction. Now, that didn't really happen with C, right? With C, where would you put the load to generate the worst case response? D, right? Put it at D, put it at the end. And so if I had a 50 kip load at D, the reaction at C is 4 thirds of 50. That's how that works. But don't worry, we're going to do some applications of influence lines right later. I'm not really worried about your ability to apply the influence lines right now. I just want you to be able to draw them. What do you think? Any questions? Okay. Let's... Go to the next problem. I'm going to give you a sec to copy this because, wait, oh, that's the wrong mouse. All right, so here's the problem. I'm going to give you a sec a little bit on this one. This, this, I want to make sure that you've got this written down. Take your time. All right. 
Everybody got this written down? Okay. Um, so let's draw our influence lines. And let's say AY, BY, CY. Do you need to worry about that? No, that's a great question. No. But what we're going to do, just so you're aware, we're going to come back to this problem and draw the influence lines on Monday for the shears and moments at that point. So for today, no. But now, later. Like, I have three lines there. I can delete that one. Put this one down some. Something like that. Okay. But, yeah, we don't need to worry about it for today. It's a great question. The answer is no. Now, I'm, I'm a, an easygoing guy. Tell me which one you'd like to start with. You want to do it alphabetically? You want to pick one in the middle? I don't care. Start with A. Okay. So let's look at the influence line for the reaction at A. Let's do some gut checks first. What's the value at A? What's the value at B? What's the value at C? Zero. One. Zero. Zero. Whatever I draw, I better get that part right. Well, I did something wrong. Where's the hinge? Is the hinge at B? No. The hinge is right there. So if I remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at A, and I take point A and I move it up one, what's it look like? Does it, go, does it go like this, this to that? No. It goes to the hinge. It goes this to there. Boom. That's your influence line. That's it. Boom. That's zero. That's your influence line. That's it. How many of you are starting to like see it now? Once you see it, it's it's good. Is there anybody that's having any questions about how I'm doing this? Again, we will worry about applying these influence lines later. I, I want to start simple. Okay. Right now, I just want to draw them. Everybody good? Okay. My man suggested doing this alphabetically. We're going to do it alphabetically. Influence line for the reaction at B. What's the value here? What's the value here? What's the value here? Okay. So, one, zero, zero. Whenever you're drawing an influence line for a reaction, that should be your first instinct. Zero, one, zero. Zero, zero, one. One, zero, zero. How many straight line segments are there going to be for this beam? Two. Because there's a single hinge. One hinge means two segments. So if I pick point B up, but fix it here, I'm going to have a straight line segment going here, and where's it going to stop? Hinge, then she's going to drop back down. So the influence line for the reaction at B is going something about like this. Like that. Oh, I need to do a shape line. Come on. Behave. There you go. So that's the answer, but while we're in the prospects of this, we might as well see if we can figure out what these values are. We'll call this, I don't know, B1, B2, just so that we're all sort of speaking the same language. 
Can anybody tell me? Let's do the math. Let's actually do the math over here off to the side. So we're doing rise over run. So 1.0 is to something as B1 is to something as B2 is to something. What's the rise over run for the 1? We rise up 1 over a run of what? 20. This is 20. Okay, what's the rise over run for B1? Rise of B1 over a run of what? Say it again. No, B1. 28. Because we're trying to figure out what this height is. And this height goes from B1 to 0 over this distance, which that distance is 8 plus 14 plus 6, which is 28. So what's B2? What's the run for B2? 6, right? Does that make sense? So would you agree that Would you agree with that? So just multiply both sides, multiply both sides? Is that fair? Did I do that too fast? If I did, tell me. I'm just saying like 1 is to 20 as B1 is to 28. Multiply both sides by 28, I get B1. 1 is to 20 as B2 is to 6. Multiply both sides by 6 and I get this. So 28 over 20, what's that, 1.4? What's this, 0 0.3? Is that right? Does that make sense? All right, we'll stop for a second. We'll see if that went too fast. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. So let's see if we can do our last one. Let's see if we can do CY. So CY, we got plenty of time. All right, so what's this value here? Let's see, this is zero, zero, one. And where does our line, so we have two line segments. Where does it change slope? At the hinge, right? With me so far? So should it go like that? Like that? Is that how it should go? So maybe, I don't know. Wait, hold on. So that's one, that's zero, and then another line. Goes like that. So, let's put some terms on here. Let's call this C1. C2. First off, anybody tell me what C1's got to be? Negative 0.4. How about C2? But does the slope ratio bear that out? Well, 1.0 is to 20 as C1 is to 8 as C2 is to 14, right? Maybe I should put a negative on that C1 since it's negative, right? So what do I get for C1? 8 over 20, what is 8 over 20? 4 over 10, 0.4. 14 over 20, 0.7. And 7. hold on, what is that plus that plus that? What is that plus that plus that? 
that plus that plus that that plus that plus that that plus that plus that who satisfied vertical equilibrium influence lines are a tricky topic so we're going to take it slow we're going to start with just this your homework assignment has two problems that are just this one of them's easy one of them's a little bit on the tricky side You have given me inspiration for homework 8.2. I'm smiling under the mask. Like an evil smile, or? Um, well, it's, I'll let you figure that out. Am I that mean? <laughs> Some parameters. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, let me stop for a sec. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. What we're going to do next time, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What we're going to do next time is we're going to do influence lines for shear and moment. And the way that influence lines for shear and moment are going to work is this. So let's say here's the beam, and I want to determine the influence line for the moment right here. What I do is I put a hinge right here, and I move that through a rotation. So you end up having like three segments. And then for shear, imagine taking this and cutting it in half, and taking the left side going down, the right side going up. It's like a shear displacement. Sound good? Have fun with this homework. I will see you all on Monday. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. Be safe.